History records that the first commercial oil production in the United States was gauged in a wooden stave, eight barrel fish oil tank with a pine slat marked in feet, inches, and fractions of inches. By the turn of the century, steel tapes were being used for tank gauging. A few years later, the wooden stave production tanks, which required periodic hoop drives to prevent leakage, began being replaced by the more efficient steel tanks. To this day, manual tank gauging and testing is the procedure required by most states and the federal government for measuring crude oil removed from producing properties. This is most important to remember throughout the remainder of the program. This is a lease automatic custody transfer facility. The function of this lacked unit is to accurately measure and sample the amount of crude oil which passes through. Every year, more lease tanks are being replaced by lacked units such as these. But how is this possible, since state and federal governments still require, in many cases, manual tank gauging? For the answer, let's go back about 25 years. Positive displacement meters had been successfully employed for several years in the continuous measurement of finished petroleum products. It was also known that if crude oil could be measured from the leases in this manner, considerable savings would result. With this in mind, producers, gatherers, and meter manufacturers combined their efforts in developing meters which would be rugged enough to operate successfully in crude oil service. Their efforts were successful, and the first LAC unit was installed in 1948. The unit was located in the Antelope Field, Clay County, Texas. But how did producers and gatherers get around federal and state regulations requiring manual tank gauging and testing? Soon after the first successful LAC unit was tested, exceptions to the tank gauge rule were requested on the basis that proposed LAC units could equal the accuracy of manual tank gauging and sampling. Exceptions were granted, and the LAC boom was on. Always remember that permission to use a LAC unit was granted on the assurance that it would perform with the same accuracy and dependability as manual gauging and sampling. To maintain this accuracy and dependability, you have a most important responsibility in seeing that the LACT unit is operating properly. In order to assist you in carrying out this responsibility, we will take a look at a basic LACT unit and discuss in general its components and the part they play. The components will be covered in detail in a later program. Here is a flow diagram of a typical LACT unit. The oil, as indicated by the green arrow, enters a charge pump on the left, then passes through a vertical loop where the sampler extracts a representative stream sample and stores it in a suitable container. An air eliminator is usually located at the high point in stream, and it may contain a strainer as well. The BS&W monitor also picks up a signal from the vertical loop to detect bad oil and actuate a three-way diverting valve to send the oil back to the treating system, as indicated by the red arrows. A strainer is located just ahead of the meter if one is not installed with the air eliminator. In most cases, the unit is equipped with a set-stop device in the control panel to prevent overrunning allowables. A thermometer, or thermal well and pressure gauge, are located past the meter just ahead of the prover valve connections. Last but not least is the back pressure valve and usually a swing check to keep pressure throughout the system. LACT units are generally equipped with provisions for sealing and fail-safe devices to shut down and secure the unit if any component which controls quantity or quality fails. This is an oil surge tank which is being used to service a LACT installation. Several tanks may be used on a single LACT unit and may be nothing more than old lease tanks which have been modified. The primary function of a surge tank 
is to accumulate oil from the treating and separation system, then deliver it to the lact unit. Remember that oil must be free of entrained gas or air before it enters the lact unit. Oil level controls in the surge tank govern the unit's operation with the use of high and low level switches. When oil in the tank reaches the high level switch, the lact unit is turned on. When oil reaches the low level switch, the unit is turned off. High and low level switches also prevent the tank from overflowing or from running below the pipe outlet. If the tank runs low, air can enter the lact unit where it might damage the pump and controls. The switches we use are of two general types, those actuated by a float and those actuated by tank head pressure. Normally, tank head pressure alone is not sufficient to force oil through the system. For this reason, a pump, often called a charge pump, is included between the tank and the lact unit. Charge pumps should provide a steady flow through the system and are usually centrifugal or rotary positive displacement types. Immediately downstream from the pump, we usually find the automatic sampler probe installed in a vertical run of pipe. The automatic sampler takes small quantities of oil from the stream at preset increments of volume and saves them in a sample container. The sampler probe is located just downstream from the pump so that oil and BS and W will not have time to separate after being completely mixed in the pump. Basic sediment and water, or BS and W, refers to contaminants in the oil which come from a producing formation. Please turn to exercise one. Do one page at a time and check your answers on the next page. The program will resume after this exercise is completed. The percentage of BS and W in the oil is an important factor in determining the net clean volume and therefore the price received for the oil we produce. A BS and W monitor probe is usually located just past the charging pump in the same area as the automatic sampling device. The BS and W monitor is connected electrically to a bad oil diverting valve, shutdown, or alarming devices. The bad oil diverting valve is usually a three-way valve and may be actuated in a number of ways, such as motor, hydraulic, or pneumatic drive. It is installed upstream from the meter. The gatherer has limits as to how much BS and W he can handle. He is paid for transporting only net clean oil, while the BS and W gets a free ride. Also in colder climates, excessive amounts of free water may seriously affect his operations. Accordingly, some safeguard against excessive BS and W content may be required. The BS and W monitor is just such a device. It automatically senses the percentage of BS and W flowing through the unit. It is also capable of producing a signal when a certain percent of BS and W is exceeded. This signal then actuates the bad oil diverting valve, shutdown, or alarming device. For example, where a unit is equipped with a diverting valve, let's set the BS and W monitor at 1% and put the unit in operation. When the BS and W content of the oil reaches 1.1%, the monitor signals the diverting valve actuator. The actuator sets the valve in the divert position. This causes oil to be blocked from the meter and sample probe and to flow back into the treating system. The meter and automatic sampler shut down immediately. Many units are also equipped with divert alarms, lights, horns, or other devices to alert the operator that the unit is diverting bad oil. Oil continues to circulate to the treater system until the BS and W level drops below the preset level. As it does, the monitor senses the drop 
and signals the diverting valve. After a built-in time delay to allow bad oil to be purged from the system, normal operations resume. The next item is the oil strainer. The strainer is merely a device which prevents foreign objects, such as nuts and bolts, from entering and damaging the meter. It serves the same basic function as your car's oil filter, but uses a coarser filtering element. Next is the air eliminator. Trapped air or vapor must be removed from the oil for two reasons. First, since the meter cannot distinguish between liquid and vapor, air and vapor in the oil will cause an error in measurement. Air and vapor must also be removed from the oil since large bubbles or slugs through the system can easily damage a meter. The air eliminator provides a space for oil to collect as it passes through the line. This causes the oil flow to slow down in the vessel and assists the air and vapor in breaking out of the oil. A float valve is built into the top portion of the air eliminator. As air and vapor displace oil in the top of the unit, the oil level and float are forced down. When the float drops to a certain point, a vent valve opens and allows trapped air and vapor to escape. Once the air and vapor has escaped, the oil level rises and the float causes the vent valve to close again. Some air eliminators are also equipped with a built-in strainer. One of the most important things to remember about air eliminators is that the exterior vent line valve must be open. If this valve is closed, the eliminator cannot function. Most gatherers will insist that this valve be sealed open, as you see here. This is a lacked unit meter. For now, we'll look at some of the basic equipment on this meter and leave the subject of meter testing and proving for a later program. Most lacked meters are equipped with an automatic temperature compensator. This device senses the temperature of the oil as it passes through the measuring element and adjusts the counter to register volume at the standard condition of 60 degrees Fahrenheit. However, some lack meters are equipped with temperature recorders instead of compensators. When this is the case, it is necessary to correct the meter registration to a 60 degree basis either manually or by computer. There are two types of temperature compensators. One is preset and drilled for the unit of gravity of the oil to be metered. If the gravity setting is changed, the unit must be returned to the supplier. Other temperature compensators are equipped with a gravity selector and may be changed in the field. This is the right angle drive. Its function is to transmit meter shaft rotation through gearing to the pulse generator. The pulse generator is used in proving the meter with a mechanical displacement or ball type prover. The meter has several electrical terminals. The circuitry connected to these terminals permits the meter to pace the automatic sampler and actuate the fail-safe devices. This non-resettable counter displays the cumulative number of barrels of oil which pass through the lacked unit. Some meters, in addition to non-resettable counters, are equipped with resettable counters. These valves are for connecting the meter prover. The first valve downstream from the meter is the prover inlet, and the second is the prover outlet valve. Dust caps on the quick connect hose couplers help to prevent dirt and sand from accumulating in the connections and damaging the prover. When not proving, the valve between the connections is open and the inlet and outlet valves are closed. By opening the inlet and outlet valves and closing the valve between, oil may be diverted through the prover. The valve between the two prover connections is often called the proving block valve. The block valve between the two prover valves is the most important on the unit. During a proving run, this block valve must completely close the pipeline between the two prover connections. Remember that when proving a meter, every drop of oil through the meter must also pass through the prover. 
If the block valve does not completely close the line, some oil will leak through. Proving under these conditions will cause the meter factor to be understated, and you'll be giving some of your production away on future metering runs. To test for leakage, the block valve is provided with a leak detection device. This is usually a small bleeder valve installed in the bottom of the block valve. The bleeder valve is left open during meter provings. If oil is observed coming from the bleeder valve, the proving must be delayed until the block valve can be greased or adjusted and the leakage stopped. While on the subject of leakage, remember that no leakage, either internal or external, is permitted on a lacked unit. This includes all fittings and connections in the system. This installation is typical of units which are served by portable provers. For those units equipped with permanent provers, the hookup may not be as straightforward, but the principle will be the same. Downstream from the prover connections is the back pressure or regulating valve. This valve serves to maintain a selected amount of back pressure on the system. If the lacked unit were allowed to run without the proper amount of back pressure, vapor could break out in the meter, causing measurement error and possible damage to the meter itself. The automatic sampling system could also be affected. Many of the back pressure valves on a lacked unit are designed to serve as block and check valves in addition to their function as pressure regulators. Such valves prevent oil from gravitating to or from the unit when it is not in operation. Where a back pressure valve controls only unit pressure, a check valve is added to prevent oil from backing up into the unit. At this point, we've reached the end of the unit, and close by is a flange where the gatherer's facilities connect. Let's stop here and do exercise two. Be sure to change your carousel tray. In many cases, when selling crude oil, we must know its API gravity for pricing purposes. In all cases, the percent of BS&W must be known and deducted. We can't expect to receive money for delivering sand and water. To determine the API gravity and percent of BS&W, we must first have a sample which is representative of the oil measured by the meter. This sample is obtained and stored by the automatic sampler for this purpose. The sample probe which we examined earlier is connected to the sample container by a section of small diameter tubing. The sample pump or valve is installed in this section of tubing between the end of the probe and the sample container. This pump or valve opens and closes on a signal from the meter. As it opens, a small portion of oil enters the sample probe, travels through the tubing, and eventually reaches the sample container. Since the collected sample must be representative of the volume of oil metered, the meter signals the sampler at given intervals. These intervals may be every barrel, every five barrels, or whatever is specified in the design of the lacked unit. The container must be vapor tight and capable of preserving the oil samples in the same state as they were collected. Remember that samples must be stored properly or a loss in gravity may result. Since gravity in some cases affects price, a loss in gravity could mean a reduction in price. The sample container is equipped with a mixing or circulating system. The oil sample must be completely mixed before it is withdrawn for testing. Once a sample is withdrawn, the sample container and mixing system must be completely drained and prepared for the next sampling. In no case should BS&W be carried over in the next sample. This, of course, would cause an error in the BS&W test of the next sample. The sampling container and circulating system should be designed in such a way as to allow the entire unused contents to be drained. 
This includes liquid in the circulating pump. A quick closure device should also be provided for convenient inspection of the container. In many cases, it is necessary to flush the container and circulation system with an approved solvent. Federal and state governments have established limits or allowables on the amount of oil which may be removed from a field over a certain amount of time. The allowable set stop counter may be installed in the meter stack or in a meter control panel. In all cases, its function is to shut down and secure the lack unit once the allowable is reached. The total allowable is set on the counter before a lack unit is put into operation for a given period. Once the unit is started, one barrel is deducted for each barrel registered on the meter's counter. When the allowable is counted down to zero, the unit is automatically stopped. Allowances are usually made in setting the counter for the expected BS&W content and for the meter factor. Remember that according to the law, a volume of oil must be accurately measured and sampled before it may be removed from a producing property. With tank gauging, this was practically guaranteed unless the wrong tank was open to the line. But how do we comply with such laws when a typical lact unit is filled with all sorts of gadgetry and potential malfunctions which could result in unmeasured and unsampled oil leaving a property? The answer is in the installation of various fail-safe devices. The basic device is simply a timer, similar to the one your wife may use in baking. One such timer is a part of the meter stack. A cam on the meter shaft sets the timer and starts it counting down. If the meter locks or malfunctions during this countdown, the cam will not complete its revolution and reset the timer. If the timer runs out, it trips a switch, shutting down and securing the unit. Similar devices are used in the automatic sampler and pump circuitry. On every fail-safe device, there is some method of warning the unit operator that something is wrong. This is an oversimplification of fail-safe devices. Many are made up of sophisticated solid-state components, but it will give you some idea of what has happened when the lights start flashing and the horns start blowing. Now let's work exercise three. These are the basic components of a typical lack unit. In working with various units, you will probably encounter a number of designs employing many different makes of components. Remember, however, that they are all designed to accomplish the same purpose, furnishing accurate, dependable oil measurement and sampling. The following are a few of the main points of consideration to ensure that the lack unit is operating properly. First, a well-designed unit should be operating smoothly with little vibration and a constant flow rate and pressure. Should a unit be vibrating with erratic flow and pressure, the chances are good that a component is on the verge of malfunction. There could be any number of reasons. A cycling back pressure valve, cycling diverting valve, a pipeline reciprocating pump on air or with valve trouble or a damaged charge pump can all have a similar effect. Occasionally, you should check the surge tank level. A low level switch failure may be loading the unit with air or excessive amounts of bottoms. A clogged strainer in need of cleaning can reduce a unit's flow rate to a point below the minimum allowed. You should be familiar with the unit's normal flow rate. If the meter appears to be running slow or fast, check the flow rate. Keep the proving rate in mind. If a meter is not operating at or near its proving rate, measurement error will result. If you are unsure of the meter's flow rate range, check the identification plate on the side of the meter. It will include the meter's minimum and maximum flow rates. 
remember that if the meter is not proved or operated within this range, measurement error will result. Periodically check the last gravity readings against the setting on the automatic temperature compensator. The setting must be within a degree or two of the oil being handled by the unit. Occasionally, check the oil level in the automatic sampler container, sight glass, or piston stem clearance. You should know how much oil the unit handles in a day, and your sample increase should be about the same for each day. If the level or piston stem clearance changes radically, you should inspect the sampler for a possible malfunction. Trust the unit's bs and w monitor and do not override its setting. You may get around a treating problem, but remember the automatic sampler is designed to extract samples from a completely mixed stream. Overriding the monitor could cause a bad sample, and the giveaway resulting from an overstated BS and W deduction could prove costly. Last but not least, you should follow the maintenance instructions. The LACT unit is one big cash register which helps keep our company in business. The LACT unit contributes to our paychecks and benefits, provides accurate and honest accounting for the royalty owners, purchasers, and tax collectors. This completes the program. Now do the final exercise.